We all rely on farmers and ranchers, but farming is riskier than other businesses out there. Crop insurance helps farmers manage their risk. With crop insurance, farmers put skin in the game by paying premiums and shouldering deductibles. That keeps taxpayers from having to pick up the whole bill every time disaster strikes. Today, about 90% of U.S. farmland is insured, providing $100 billion in protection to more than 130 different kinds of crops. It's a testament to the program's success. Thank you for joining us for our AgriPulse Washington Week interview. I'm Spencer Chase, joined as always by AgriPulse Executive Editor Phil Brasher, as well as this week by Congressman Mike Conaway, the retiring uh, ranking member of the House Agriculture Committee. And um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Conaway, appreciate you joining us. Well, thanks, Spencer, and uh, it felt good to be with you today. Appreciate it. So for starters, want to talk uh, kind of a, have a, a bit of a wide ranging conversation here that starts on sort of the news of the day. And that, of course, is uh, Congress uh, making uh, making progress, uh, seemingly uh, some progress on this broader subject of COVID relief and also government funding with that, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, seemingly uh, similar timelines uh, on both of those subjects here before uh, folks adjourn for the year. Wondering, uh, we've seen this bipartisan Senate proposal specifically on the subject of COVID relief, a $908 billion proposal, $13 billion uh, going toward agriculture. Wondering your thoughts on that measure and just the, the broader concept at this point of, of additional relief for agriculture and the broader economy. Well, especially you really can't have that conversation without talking about what we've done to the, to the debt situation of our nation over the last uh, eight months, uh, well over a 10% increase in the national debt. So when you begin to talk about new money, uh, that's, uh, that should come in a context of saying, you know, how do we pay for that and where do we pay for it? The 2021 budget will be a deficit. You know, we just had probably the single largest deficit in our nation's history, something like $3.3 trillion deficit, uh, deficits as far as the eye can see. And so um, there are, though, monies within the $2.5 trillion or so that's been appropriated so far. I think the number's north of $400 billion that uh, we should repurpose. And out of that repurposed money, uh, clearly, ag, uh, there are interests within and needs within the agriculture in, in, uh, areas, production agriculture, rural America, that must be addressed as you look at repurposing uh, those dollars. But new money on top of that, uh, I'm going to be really reticent, reticent to, uh, uh, to support that. The uh, bipartisan proposal they're working on in the Senate uh, has uh, $13 billion in new money for agriculture. Do you think that's, uh, do you think that, do you think that amount is needed, first of all? Um, yeah, I think if you look at the, uh, well, thanks. So I think if you look at the, uh, what's happening, uh, in, uh, in rural America and production agriculture, particularly the 2020 disasters that have not yet been addressed, uh, by, uh, any kind of ad hoc program that might or might not come in, into play, uh, I think it's, uh, the needs are, uh, can be demonstrated that are north of that number, uh, clearly. And even coming out of what we've already done, uh, with the CARES package that uh, was already done, uh, the, uh, rural America and uh, uh, production agriculture did not get uh, made whole, certainly, uh, by, the, uh, by the money that was uh, allocated under those two programs. The other big development this week, of course, was the news that um, uh, President-elect would probably nominate uh, Tom Vilsack uh, for another term as Agriculture Secretary. Um, as Chairman, you dealt with, uh, with the Secretary uh, uh, the issue that I particularly remember was trying to get cotton seed uh, made eligible for the commodity programs that Congress wound up having to do that because he insisted he didn't have the authority. Another issue where you dealt with him was in the biotech labeling issue. He got out uh, early kind of promoting the idea of using the uh, smartphone labels, the QR labels to, to address that issue. Uh, what, uh, what should uh, folks in agriculture know about uh, about Tom Vilsack? Well, I think, uh, you know, having a, someone else who's got deep experience in the Obama administration, uh, you know, now come forward and come back into those roles. Um, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at what he did the eight years he was uh, uh, worked for President Obama. Uh, this seems to be a theme with the uh, with, uh, presumptive presidential elect uh, Biden that he likes folks he's worked with before uh, out of the you know, Obama administration. So it looks like a, a, a lot of repeat there. Uh, I had a good working relationship with uh, Secretary Vilsack. Uh, we had differences of opinion, uh, but he was always uh, cordial and straightforward with me. So uh, given the other, some of the other names that were pitched, uh, I think this is a, uh, a good selection by, uh, by, uh, by Biden to, uh, to bring a, a steady hand uh, into a uh, really tumultuous circumstances right now in the world of production, agriculture, rural America, 
And so having uh, known what, uh, you know, what Tom did for eight years uh, is helpful in looking at what he might do uh, for the next four. But I would anticipate that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, G.T. Thompson, who will take my place, uh, will also have a good work relationship with, uh, with Tom. Mm-hmm. Uh, looking ahead, you won't be here for the, the next Farm Bill 2023 uh, is when it's due. But I'd like to get your read on what you think is going to be the major issues that they're going to have to deal with. Um, obviously, we've come through some tough times in agriculture with commodity prices, but a number of them are headed up. Even cotton is looking a little better than it was there for a while. Corn and uh, corn and soybeans in particular are doing um, much better as the exports uh, start to pick up with, with China. Um, is, are we going to need to do anything with the commodity programs um, going into this next farm bill? Can we do anything with these commodity programs? And um, do you see more money shifting uh, into uh, conservation green payment sort of schemes, whether it's the carbon bank or the other ideas that have been floated? Well, I think you, you have to start with the reconciliation of just the stunning amount of monies that uh, went into rural America through the MFP payments and the CARES Act and the impact that's had. Uh, how do you reconcile uh, that level of support uh, uh, with what uh, uh, has at least the last couple of farm bills been an attempt to either hold flat or reduce uh, monies allocated to the, the non-nutrition uh, titles in, the, in that bill? Uh, it's a little premature to understand where our financial circumstances will be at that point in time, but that will be a big driver. And then how do you reconcile, uh, you know, everything was spent on top of uh, the, uh, the farm bill. Farm bills are never intended uh, to handle pandemic impacts like we've had and or the monster trade uh, uh, fight that we had, which now seems to be paying dividends uh, as, uh, as China begins to, be, to buy more and, and, and the prices do come up. But uh, it's, it's going to be all about money. Uh, how much money will they have? And then that will drive what can you do with it? Um, I do anticipate, given the, uh, the early on uh, talk about a, you know, some sort of a carbon market credit, something out of the CCC. Uh, that's an indication that uh, there will be, uh, you know, attempts to move monies uh, into those programs where they get them from, whether it's out of the commodity title. Um, I can't imagine they'll take it out of the nutrition title, but there's just uh, money there that, uh, uh, that could be had as well. Uh, you know, it just remains to be seen. But I think the real issue, Phil, is just uh, how do we uh, reconcile rural America's expectations for the safety net versus what they've experienced over the last, uh, you know, three, three years. And the last, uh, last question, uh, the uh, Agricultural Secretary Purdue obviously has uh, used the Commodity Credit Corporation Authority very broadly, uh, both to form the uh, market facilitation program and these um, coronavirus relief payments. Uh, you all in Congress, Republicans in Congress, pushed back on uh, Secretary, then Secretary Vilsack, when he used uh, the CCC, uh, used his CCC authority back in 2010. Um, have you gone well, I, the other I, way? Uh, uh, here's uh, let's just get a full context there. Uh, Vilsack did use it, but he used it for one state. Everything that Vils- everything that uh, Sonny Perdue did was uh, agnostic as to where it was. He was just trying to take care of all of America. So I think there's a real distinction uh, between those two. Uh, and there's always tension uh, between the latitude uh, provided under CCC. We've got some guardrails on there. Um, it's interesting, my Democrat colleagues, when they thought that there would be a second term for President uh, Trump, were wanting to put some really strict restrictions on that 20 billion that was in the original proposals. Now they don't seem to be quite as, uh, as concerned about that. But I do think there is a difference between targeting one state and one Senate race, as Bill Sack did, versus what uh, Sonny Perdue did. You're comfortable with what, with the authority, the way it's being used now? I, I am. I think the, uh, you know, uh, 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 Perdue said no to some things. Uh, ethanol producer, the refineries, he didn't, he didn't think he could use the program there. Um, you know, there were some things proposed, I think, out of the White House that, that uh, Perdue said, no, that's, uh, that won't work. And so I think the uh, secretary... Uh, we, we'll, uh, we use good discretion. I think Bill Stack would use good discretion as well. He had that one gaffe that caused a, a ruckus. But uh, just the fact that um, you know, before he gets there, they're already talking about using the CCC in a unique, brand new way uh, tells you that uh, this is a subject that if Congress is going to continue to have their hands on the purse strings, that they will need to watch whoever secretary is, you know, how they use it. Is it using it 
for intended purposes uh, or, uh, or political gain, as was done in, uh, uh, in uh, Blanche Lincoln's case. Right. You're talking about using the CCC for ag carbon bank. Right. Congressman, want to get you out of here on, on this last thought. Uh, you, you announced at uh, kind of a gathering of, of four current and, and former uh, House Ag chairman last week, uh, you had announced that uh, one, a former staffer of yours, uh, Bart Fisher, is working on a book that's going to categorize kind of the, the 200 years of the House Agriculture Committee. And uh, I, I'm guessing uh, among very certain, uh, very specific circles, that'll be a page turner. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I guess my, my question for you is, when, uh, when it gets to the, to the chapter about Chairman Mike Conaway, what, what do you hope that the readers of that book and, and future uh, observers of farm policy history, what do you want people that look at your tenure as chairman to, to know and to understand about, uh, about those years? Yeah, Spencer, I hope you spelled my name right. And that, uh, that's more than a page uh, out of the deal. Now, I, the four years I was chair, uh, I'm really proud of the work that we had uh, that we got done. Obviously, the 18 Farm Bill is the big signature thing, but we also, I, was, I was also able to lead a fight in uh, 2015 against uh, the, the impact on uh, crop insurance that the Obama administration tried to do, got that done. As you mentioned earlier on, I got cotton seed back under Title I. Um, so there's some things that, that I did. I'm hopeful that uh, there's enough evidence that I look beyond just District 11 as chairman, that I was looking at all of America and all of the uh, issues that are facing our nation, not just the few things that, uh, uh, that impacted uh, uh, you know, District 11, that I was a one well, of those chairmen that looked at all of the country uh, that or felt like you're chairman of all of agriculture, all of production agriculture uh, for the country, that the things we did, um, you know, represented good faith efforts to try to address the issues that, that fight there. I also wanted, I hope this says something affected of how proud I am to be able to, to have represented some of the most decent, honest, hardworking, God-fearing men and women this nation has ever produced. And that's the folks who live in rural America. Uh, <clears throat> they are the backbone of our nation. Um, those values on which our nation was founded, the Judeo-Christian values on which we uh, uh, were founded are, are practiced in rural America and they're in safekeeping there. They seem to get lost when we get into big cities, but, but I am really proud that I was able to be a champion on their behalf. And, uh, and I hope that, that uh, they're, they're able to say uh, that, uh, that I made a difference while I was, uh, while I was chairman. Uh, but I'm proud of the work I'm had. I'm proud of the people I was putting, that, that worked with me. Uh, you know, Matt Schertz and Bart Fisher led the uh, led the staff. That staff I had on the 28 farm, 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, now that I'm leaving, I can say this publicly: was head and shoulders better than the staff of the other three negotiators in that deal. My team was the best that's ever had it, and the Farm Bill, the 18 Farm Bill, their fingerprints, my staff's fingerprints, are all over it for the good. And uh, I'm proud of the work that they did. I'm proud that I was able to lead that that effort. But uh, they. Uh, Pound for pound, my guys were better than the other three altogether. And, and I'm sure that's coming from a completely unbiased perspective as well on, on your part. Big objective on this. I've got no biases at all. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, uh, as always, appreciate you stopping by and, uh, and sharing uh, some bits of wisdom and, and, and in this case, some, some history and perspective as, uh, as, as you make your way out of Congress and into the next chapter of your life. Always appreciate your time, Mr. Conway. Thank you, Spencer. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it, boys. For Phil Brasher and Congressman Mike Conway, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one.